Hi, I'm Chelsea Valench, and I am the Lifecycle Marketing Manager at Guru. I've been there for about seven months now. Great. Hey, I'm Chris Anderson, uh, Senior Director of Lifecycle Engagement and Retention at Guru. been here for a few years. Thanks, Chris. I'm Georgia. Hi, yeah, and I'm uh, Georgia. I'm the Head of Customer here at CanDo. I'm excited to hear a little bit more about Guru's strategies. All right, Chelsea, you want to kick us off? What is this about yeah, personalization and onboarding? I would love to. Give me one second. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Awesome. So today I'm going to walk you through how we were able to increase our activation at Guru by 71% with personalization. But first, I figured I'd kick us off with a little bit of background around what is Guru. So Guru is a company wiki that makes it easy to access your organization's collective information wherever and whenever you work. So it's really designed to be used in your workflow. Instead of needing to go into another portal and leave wherever you're working, you can find answers and actually create information wherever you're working. So Slack, MS Teams, um, or really any website that you're working on. And the best part, at least in my opinion, is that you can trust that information is reliable because it's regularly verified by your experts. As I said earlier, I joined Guru about seven months ago. And when I first joined, the top priority I was given was to improve activation from a lifecycle marketing perspective. Now at Guru, we define activation as the completion of these three actions within the first 14 days of signing up. And we chose those actions very specifically because we found that teams that did those three actions in the first 14 days were more likely to convert. So the goal here is to get teams activated, so then ultimately we can get them to convert. And those steps really help them realize the value of Guru. Now I fit into the, this and can help impact that activation number in addition to everything that our product team is doing, because I'm ultimately responsible for all the communications that we send to users post sign up. So really my role is to help drive lifetime value. And when I look at like the first sign up window, that first goal that we're trying to achieve is activation. I should also, sorry, I didn't say this earlier. If anyone has any questions while we're going, feel free to put it in the chat or, or Adam or Georgia, feel free to chime in and interrupt me. So my role at Guru was brand new. And so prior to me joining, we didn't have someone that was specifically just looking at all of our communications, but we did have some campaigns live, specifically one here that I'm, I'm showing on screen. It was our onboarding series that goes to teams in that first 14 days. This one technically went out within the first 15 days. And so with that top priority in mind of trying to improve activation, the first thing I did was look at what do we have going on today and figure out what are the opportunities. And my initial observations were that we had really good engagement with these emails, but it was very linear and therefore there was an opportunity to personalize it and, and make sure with some decision tree logic so that we're sending the right information to people at the right time, as opposed to sending the same email to everyone. So like, for example, we don't need to, if one of the, our actions in our activation criteria is using one of our integrations, I don't necessarily need to send an email about integrations to someone who has already used one of our integrations. Chelsea, just curious. So in that five-part series, were all of those emails very focused on those three activities to become activated? They were, content was like in the right place. It just, uh, okay, cool. we were sending the same content. To I'm everyone. totally guilty of making this mistake before of not aligning our emails with the key activities that people need to do to become activated. Okay. Well, that's, that's a good yeah. baseline anyway. <laughs> I, I will build on that though. One of the steps in our activation criteria is creating cards and you actually have to create um, about five of them. And mm. we only had one email that talked about that, but it also talked about a bunch of other things. So that right. is one of the big changes that I, I did make that I'll, I'll walk you through in a minute. Okay. okay. More on that, because that is one of the biggest hurdles and it's really the first thing you have to do. In the user journey. Yeah, I think where I left off was that in addition to that personalization, the other opportunity is increasing touch points. So there's a lot of things that we are trying to get users to do in that first 14 days and only five emails, it might be enough for everything that we want to do. Plus there's an opportunity to bring in other mediums or, or channels. And, and for us, we were looking at in-app um, messages. So if someone is logged into our app, we could serve them a, a message and that doesn't require them to have to open up that email. Before I show you what, what we did, I wanted to just take a step back and share some stats from Segment. They just produced a state of personalization report. They did their last one they did, I think was in 2017. But I thought some of these stats really showed the importance of personalization. So the first one, 
45% of consumers will likely take their business elsewhere if a brand fails to offer a personalized experience. I thought this was really powerful because the kind of reverse of that is that if you can deliver that personalized experience, you're going to be more likely to get their business. Kind of moving into the next one, 60% of consumers will become repeat buyers after a personalized shopping experience. So if you can deliver that personalized experience, not only are you likely to get that first sale, but also be more likely to, to be repeat buyers and, and purchase from you again. The last one I found interesting because it speaks to trust. So 69% of consumers appreciate personalization as long as it's data they've shared directly with that company. So as we think about personalization, it is important to think about what are you asking of your users? Because you need to make sure you're asking them questions that you can then personalize the content for. Sometimes people will get a little bit standoffish or angry if they feel like that you're pulling data from third-party sources about. Chelsea, I'm curious when you're talking about personalization, I think there are a couple of different ways that we think about and talk about personalization. One is the sort of classic email marketing, like high name, just like adding in personal details or variables basically about users. And then there's a whole another category of personalization that is more, I think what you were talking about, which is like the whole user journey gets personalized, the whole body of content like becomes relevant. Do you know if Segment was talking about one or the other, or both of those ideas? Great question. I am fairly confident they're talking about the latter and, and not something as simple as like merge fields, like first name. We were doing that at Guru like before I joined. I feel like that table stakes. I guess if you're thinking about like an e-commerce, I think this is just such a popular thing to do in e-commerce, but to be like showing people what they've looked at most recently to get them back into the app and that kind of personalization is more what really drives users back into the experience. Mm -hmm. So now I'll, I'll walk you through how we were able to improve activation. So we broke this up in, into phases. So we took that first very linear journey and our first phase was to add in this decision tree logic and in-app messages. So this is a zoomed in screenshot of the first part of the journey. It's definitely a longer series. Apologies if this is a little bit hard to read. Can you guys see my mouse? Can you see where I point to? Yeah. So what I wanted to highlight here is that we have lots of, of steps to check if someone did something. So we start off our email with a product tour. Then the first mm -hmm. thing we do is we check to see if they've created. And if they have, we then check to, there's some additional rules to see if we can deliver that in-app message. And if so, then we'll send them that in-app message. If I zoom down this way, I'll pick a different one here. So basically there's several emails that talk about the card creation, all of these in here. I'll skip ahead to maybe this one here. So at this point it's about day four in the journey and we're checking to see if they have created those five plus cards. If they have, we're going to stop talking to them about cards. They're not going to get this email. They're not going to get this in-app prompt. They're not going to get this email. Instead, they're going to um, jump right ahead to information about our sources and integrations. But if they haven't, then they're going to continue down this journey so that we can continue to give them inspiration and get them over wherever they're, they're feeling. Any questions about that? Yeah, actually, Chelsea, I'm just curious. So with those different activities that you're nudging users to complete, so how much of those activities um, were based on an intuition that this is what they should be doing versus data driven that we know that this activity is going to lead to a user who's activated and eventually. So those three um, actions that we're trying to get are all data driven. So our oh. data team had done the work to say, if users can take these steps and they're more likely to convert, what was maybe a little bit more intuition was the order of those steps. So they are not necessarily right. linear to download an integration before you create a card, but we feel that, that we work at Guru, we know the product, we have an order that we think makes the most sense for users, but right. we do check in the flow. If they take a different pathway, that's fine too. Okay. That makes sense. So I, this is something that even we're working on right now. I, I guess in terms of order of logic, it makes the most sense where you observe your user's behavior and you identify those activities that lead them to become successful. So you, you carve out a cohort of, oh, but these people who became successful, these are the set of activities they did. And then your communication aligns with nudging people to more of those people who are not in that cohort to move into that cohort. Yeah. Exactly. Makes a ton of sense. And what is this diagram, by the way? Is this the marketing automation tool or is this your own? But this is a screenshot of the marketing automation tool. We, we oh. are using Intercom. I'll talk more about that in, mm -hmm. in a second. And the interface? 
Uh, so this is their series here where you, you build out your uh, user flow. And then I just want you to uh, show an example of one of the in-app messages. This is the first in-app message that we show a user and we try to get them to take our training. This particular prompt had really strong engagement. It was our top performing one. And we also have data to back up. If users take this training, we cover all those activation criteria in that training. And then therefore they're most likely to get activated too. So after we went through that phase, um, we then decided to take this to the next level and, and personalize the content based off of data that we had received about the user. So when someone signs up for Guru, they tell us what team they're in. So I'll know if they work in marketing or HR or sales. And then we also ask for use case. So what is the primary reason or multiple reasons that they signed up for Guru? Our use cases are to improve internal communications, streamline the, the so product enablement, streamline the product development um, process, or employee onboarding. Now that field is optional. So we, we really wanted to migrate there, but because we don't have that data for everyone, since we do know what team they're on, we're able to map out what we think their associated use cases might be based off of their role. Like for example, if someone is in HR, I can pretty confidently say that they're probably using Guru for internal communications and employee onboarding, probably not as involved in product enablement. Sorry. I keep trying to move my, where my video is on the screen. And for this one, we thought it was really important that we structured a, a true AB test so that we could go back to the business and say, you know, here, if we do this, here's the lift that we can do. And we were hopeful that maybe that would help prioritize making that use case field a mandatory. So we structured it as a true experiment and came up with our hypothesis that a personalized onboarding experience based on role and use case information would increase activation. In an ideal world, we would have been able to do a true like 50-50 split and done this for all roles. Unfortunately, with our the tool that we were using, Intercom, Intercom's great, love Intercom for chat, love Intercom for so many things. But from an email perspective, they're like adding all these new features, but at the currently they don't have the ability to do dynamic content. And so they had merge fields. So you could definitely, what you're saying earlier, Georgia, you could add in your first name. I could add in to a subject line that they work in sales. But if I wanted to personalize, let's say body copy or um, a template that I, it might be specific to someone in sales or a certain use case, I couldn't do that. And I couldn't do that within one email. So what that meant is I had to take my generic series and then duplicate that for however many versions I wanted to add that personalization. So given that from like bandwidth constraints, we chose, and just efficiency, we chose our top three roles. And then we want, would have loved to do the 50-50 split of if you're in one of those top three roles, 50% get personalized, 50% get generic. But because we're only taking three roles, like we had a sample size issue. So we over-indexed for personalization. So 80% got the personalized flow, 20% got the generic, and then all of our other roles got the generic. And what that allowed us to do was to then look at the total personalization cohort and compare that to the total generic cohort. And that's where we saw that huge lift in um, personalization. But then also what we needed to do was zoom in on each of those specific roles and check to make sure that the personalization cohort in, let's say, sales was higher than that in the generic. And it, and it was. The only issue that we have is that because they're small sample sizes, when you look at just those roles, you don't have statistical significant um, results. So it's directional only where we have the statistical significance is looking at the whole personalization cohort against the whole generic cohort. It's always interesting in marketing, obviously, and any part of working in tech when we're working, especially in SaaS businesses, when we are working with those smaller sample sizes, I think when we take a step back and think about the fact that our goal is really to increase activation and to try and figure out what to move the needle on and knowing that we can make lots of iterative changes, statistical significance is great to get. And it's awesome when we get those kinds of sample sizes, but being able to show, even if it's in a proxy way that we've moved the needle is a great indicator that we're doing something that's along the right path and that we can keep iterating from there. Yeah, exactly. So I wanted to then just show you guys a couple examples of, of how we were personalized. So this is an example of, of an email and an in-app message that we send to people in sales. So you can see I have some in the H1 here that kind of speaks to sales, same in the subject line and then the body copy. You could probably use merge fields for the subject line and the H1 here, but don't think you, you could necessarily for the body copy. And then in the in-app message, we talk about sales here and for the other personalized roles, they're not always just placing in the name. Sometimes it's talking about what someone in sales might be using Guru for or no, not sales, but another.
And then I wanted to compare sales. So the personalized version against the generic, just to show you some of those differences. This is probably a really good example. Here, another one in the, the H1 where you have sales versus none. Again, you could probably use merge fields here. This is an example of where you couldn't use merge fields and where you would need a different technology. So we have different stats on terms of like how beneficial Guru can be when it is for like just, we have ones for just generically how Guru can help, but then we have like ones for, if you are a sales team, so here's what we found specifically for sales teams. So we're able to personalize these stats here to make them like really resonate with the sales team. Additionally, I have a case study that I want to share with users about another sales team and, and how they benefited from Guru. So I can put that in, in here versus um, in my generic version. I, I don't have something like that. This over here is a, an email that has some examples of our templates um, and all of the examples down here are very um, personalized to either the fact that you're in sales, um, like the competitor battle card, or why we think that someone in sales would use Guru. So the number one use case we probably think of is product enablement. And these example templates really speak to that. Whereas in generic, I'm not really personalizing it to role. So I'm trying to use templates that are going to have the broadest breadth and be relevant to everyone. And sometimes the downside is then it could be relevant to, to not as relevant to everyone. So just in, in summary, we had really great success when we did the, the test on personalization. Overall, we saw a 71% lift in activation and then saw a 56% lift in, in conversion. So super excited. So as a next step, of course, we really wanted to roll out personalization for all roles. But as I said earlier, and we didn't necessarily have the tech stack to be able to do that. So we are in the process of migrating to a new marketing automation tool that will allow us to drive personalization at scale. In the meantime, we're, because activation is so important to be, we're actively testing optimization to the generic series, just to, you know, squeeze as much life out of it as we can. And then once we're on the new tool, roll out those personalized kind of key takeaways for those that are listening, personalization can definitely help you accelerate growth suggest that you start small and just continuously iterate, which we're just saying before, you might not always get statistical significance, but if you can get some directional learnings, those can still be extremely beneficial. And technology out there does exist to help you personalize at scale so you don't have to duplicate um, things over and over again. Are you open uh, to questions? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> sort of general things I'm curious about. So now that um, you've reported these results for those specific roles, I forget, did you say before that when somebody signs up reporting what role you are is mandatory today or yes. it has been, but intend to do is not mandatory? Yes. Okay. So that is the, the use case. We're still working on that internally um, to hopefully make that mandatory field. Oh, got it. Okay. So I was curious, like if there's any product changes as a result of this experiment. Yeah, there it's definitely in the pipeline. I just off the top of my head don't have an exact date, but it is something that we're working on. Yeah, and okay, Chris, I cool. think a lot of people get nervous about asking a lot of questions and onboarding, both for uh fear that people will like lose focus in the five to ten questions we have to ask and anxiety about giving data and things. Did you find that though adding those questions added any friction to your process or did it not really change the numbers much? So we didn't add it, add the, the use case yet, but one of the things our product team obviously felt that way too, we're looking to actually take out a section in our sign up flow right now. We don't necessarily ask another question, but we offer them some different like templates and, and frameworks. And so what we're trying to do is take that step out and replace it with this one question. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I also think when people feel like they're opting into a process that's going to help them do better. They're a lot more willing to take a little bit more time on questionnaire steps. Yeah, exactly. If you ask for it, you have to be able to deliver something of value. Right, there. right. Yeah. Chelsea, do you mind going back to that slide that had the whole flow diagram from Intercom? Yeah. So I, I think this goes without saying, but the communication across channels, so in-app and email is going to be consistent. So if somebody completes an activity and you sent an email for it, now the in-app communication will also change. So like that's a great question. Let me put it this way. If you took that action before we try to deliver a message, absolutely. If you got the email and then you took the action and we did not yet deliver that in that message, then you wouldn't get it. But there is like a window where if we've already delivered that to you, it will not expire when you take that action until either you exit it or the time expires. And, and that's just like a nuance in terms of how we're set up with intercom, but there right. are tools out there that will make that integration slightly better. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But the ambition anyway, is to make the communication consistent across the journey. 
yeah. because this is also important to highlight. You see this sometimes inside of apps where you'll have an in-app message and then you'll have an email sent around the same time, but they're saying two different things. Oh yeah. I know, yeah. I know it sounds like obvious. It happens. Yeah. And I think it's, it's actually pretty it's, common because I think right. like in the new world of product marketing existing, that there's starting to be more alignment around how that should all work. But I think a lot of the time we're often working in different teams and at larger right. companies, at least sometimes that gets a little bit siloed. And we're, if people have different KPIs that they're working on, it's pretty easy to, to mix the messaging across in-app and, and email marketing. But it's great to see as more tools exist and as more people are talking about it, to see this idea of being within your product, being a holistic experience, no matter where you're communicating with your customer. Definitely. And I think to that point, this definitely achieves that. We're making sure that we're trying to get them to create cards or really only talk to them about cards until they have taken that action. And then we can move on both from email and in app to talk to them about something else. And I'm curious if they're leapfrogging that step. So you said there's three sort of three routes to activation. So yeah. if it, it's clear that they haven't created cards yet, that should be a focus area, but they're they're in your app doing a lot of work on the second step instead. Are there ways with your current tools to reframe the messaging on, oh, here's what you're focused on now. Let's help you get there. Yeah. I would say in this first iteration, I'm not sure that was really in there. In our latest iteration, there is so people can leapfrog around as they're doing stuff in the app. Definitely. Very cool. I love that. So, so who is the team responsible for figuring out what that path to activation was? Uh, it was a combination of our product team. So we, our product team is, is divided into to pillars. The specific one is our growth pillar and then our data team as well. So they I think you told me Guru is about 200 people. So you've got this type of org structure to support these clusters. Yeah. This is something we're working on right now. In fact, is um, figuring out that user journey inside of can do. So Georgia is very involved with this. Awesome. Well, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Thank We're you. We're going to find some good data. Yeah, at it from all angles, a little bit of learning what users want to do and a little bit of being prescriptive. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you have yeah, to exactly. do that. You can't just push what, what we want. You got to know what. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's like powerful stuff, Chelsea, very inspirational. I took some notes for us. Yeah. Thanks a lot for this. I thought maybe we could give you guys a quick intro to can do since we're yeah, love on the that. call together uh, speaking of personalization yeah. i would well, love that i just stopped sharing a little bit of a different done? flavor yeah, yeah let's try it out i'm gonna share this deck and let's pretend it's already in present mode so we also believe strongly in personalization and can talk a little bit about what can do is it's really supposed to be an in-app ui builder so instead of doing we love like for instance the intercom announcement bars but instead of doing sort of the pop-up chat the idea is that there are probably places in your ui where you want to directly communicate with your users a lot of what we do in email marketing would also be really powerful it was in the app of meeting your users when they log in so that when they're thinking about your app, the information is right there for them. I think a lot of people have been doing this with popover tools for a long time, but we believe that there's also a time and place for static content that should be updated regularly and personalized for your users. With CanDo, you can use a drag and drop editor to build that content and modify it as a non-technical user and then plug it in on certain pages. So a lot of the time that looks like a custom homepage or even an announcement bar that a product marketer or product manager or even a customer success person might be building. And the other thing we believe strongly in is that not every user on your page is going to have that should be having the same experience with certain UI elements. We also allow you to do some user segmentation within CanDo so that if, for instance, you built a homepage of CanDo, you could show a welcome message with these key activation steps to your new users. Your admins who have been in your app for two years probably don't need key activation steps and to be welcoming them into the product anymore. They probably want to hear about new feature releases or other things that get them deeper into the product or recognize their product expertise and help them find ways to be even better. So we believe that in the same space, you should be able to publish different content to different people. So we make that pretty easy. If you have data traits that you're tracking, you can send them to us and then create segmented experiences within just one page on your app. Some quick hits in my last like 30 seconds. People are using can do to do a number of different oh, things. We're, we're good. Oh, we're good. It to 45 minutes. But we've learned from experience. Thanks, Georgia. If you have any other questions standing between you and I, Georgia, for Chelsea and Chris or the audience, feel free to ask. Otherwise, we can enjoy. Thank you, Chris and Chelsea. This was a terrific presentation. I had a number of notes I was taking during while you're speaking, Chelsea, super helpful for myself. And thanks again for your time.
Absolutely. Thank you for having me. It was, it was fun. All right. Take care. Have a good day. Awesome. Forward to being in touch.